Welcome to When Pain Pins Purpose. I am Shanna Dickens, and we are here today with Morgan Richard Olivier. She is an American best-selling author, advocate, wife, and speaker. Since publishing her first book, Questions, Christ, and the Quarter-Life Crisis in 2020, and her poetry and prose collection, Blooming Bear, in 2021, Morgan has become a source of encouragement and empowerment to men and women across the world. In 2022, she published her best-selling second poetry collection, The Tears That Taught Me. So buckle up for a lot of alliteration today. <laughs> we are painting purpose and teaching tears and blooming bear. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Morgan. Thank you for having me. Of course. So we have asked some of Morgan's social media audience to submit some questions. So today we're just kind of go through those, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about your books, the writing process, and what that meant to you. Okay. So off the bat, what led you to start writing? Well, I actually started writing in 2016. It was right after my dad's elections. I did a lot of um, content creation and did a lot of speech writing and things of that nature, but it made me more comfortable talking to people. So I started writing for um, the Odyssey and I would just do these like feel good positive posts. Everything was very like bright sunshiny, you know, there's always a silver lining type of thing. And, um, but I got into this type of writing where I, f I talk about pain and depression and life lessons and faith after I went through just a, a lot of mental, emotional, personal struggles in my life. And in fact, I stopped writing during that. How long did you stop writing? Probably, what you think, probably like six months. Didn't write anything. And I just went to therapy, got into a new church. And I realized then for ministers or just people in the church that it's, for me, I, I stopped because I felt like, well, I feel like I'm not perfect. I feel like I have nothing positive to say, so I shouldn't say anything. But spiritually, it was kind of obvious that that was the whole purpose. Maybe... I feel these things because that's what I'm supposed to write about. So instead of writing all this super happy stuff, I started writing about how I felt and the lessons that I was learning and the ways in which I was learning them. And it was just very raw, but that was the best way I felt that I could release it from me and in a way that you're not even thinking about getting rejected from other people because it's your therapy. So that's really where that began. You have become such an advocate for this that I honestly forgot there was another style of writing before this. Yeah. And I think you just touched on a little bit, but another question we got a couple of times was what motivates your writing? Well, pain for one. And it's usually those things in life, those aha moments, right? And I think a lot of times when we feel pain or we feel depression or we feel resentment, we want to shy away from it. But when you come from a place where, like for my church, we dig into those feelings of emotions and spirits or in, in mental health realm, um, the sources of things, it, it helps me understand why am I feeling this, but it also helps me shift my perspective of what's the lesson in this or how could I use this to help myself or help other people. So a lot of times it's those moments in life where, okay, what is this? Let me process it. And then I literally pin it. Yeah. So your first book, Questions, Christ, and the Quarter Life Crisis, was published in 2020. Mm -hmm. Which came first, the questions, the crisis, or Christ? <sighs> <laughs> you know, I would think, um, honestly, the questions, the crisis, and then Christ. Because 25, I was just... Everything was perfect on paper. People that know me can honestly say that. Like, I was thriving professionally. Had a, I, I looked like every single thing was going for mm -hmm. me, and it was. But I questioned a lot. I questioned what was I doing with my life. Are these people my friends? Are they just here? Is this what I'm supposed to be? You know, it's just, and a lot of us have that from 25 to 34 when you're out your parents' house or you're mm -hmm. out of college, and now you're making choices for you. Is this me or is this the image of me or is this what I want my life to look like and it could be very overwhelming when you think that you are the perfect picture but you don't even know what your hobbies are you don't even someone actually you what your strengths and weaknesses are you you don't know but I could I could be the best friend or 
daughter or wife, you know, for someone else. Right. It's coming to terms with it for yourself. Mm -hmm. So this was the first book that you wrote, mm -hmm. and it, that was kind of getting into this different, raw, more uncomfortable conversation. Mm -hmm. What was that process like for you? Well, um, during that time, um, I'd been in my church for probably, what, two years? And there were so many instances of, like, conversation, like, I need to, I need to write a book. I'm doing these articles. I'm reaching people. And um, this Christian publishing company, they opened um, applications. And my best friend was like, you should do it. And at that time, I was just very nervous because I didn't want to be rejected. I didn't even have a manuscript. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to write about all this stuff I'm going through, all these things that I've been through. Very vulnerable, very, like, raw. But I'm just give it to them. And if they, they accept me, great. If they don't, it, it's helping me get over that, like, fear of rejection. And then they accepted me, and I'm like, oh, my God, I have to write all this now stuff. Now you have to do it. Now you have to I do have it. To, I have to show up. And that's the crazy thing I tell people. Like, after I got the approval, I literally started writing the manuscript for Blooming Bear because I was going to be more comfortable sharing that. How did you know how to write a manuscript? So here's the thing. So I write all the time. So even when you think this book, the first book really started being written, what, 2017, mm -hmm. 2018, 2019, because I write as I think. So we might leave here and we're on the way to get food and I'm going to think about something and I'm going to write it down. So that first book was a lot of going back into my notes and literally looking at like how am I feeling or what am I learning or how have I reframed my experiences. So that book came together from all of those times. So one of the questions we got was, uh, and it's not really a question, but moving forward from unhealthy relationships and focusing on your emotional and spiritual health. Okay. Um, I think. Any how do you do it? Right. <laughs> Anytime you do inner work or you go to therapy or you get into your faith, the objective is not to be the same. So when people say things like, oh, you've changed or you don't, that's a lot of times that little flag for you to say, I might be outgrowing this. Because people that actually see you and know you and want good for you, your growth and your detoxing and your maturity, it excites them, it inspires them, mm -hmm. they support it. When people don't do that, it's not that they're bad people, but that season with those people may have come to an end. Right. So what, I loved this question, what is the connection between mental health and spiritual warfare? Okay, so here's, oh wow, I just hit Hot that mic. thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for me, I got into mental health therapy first, right? At the time, I've, I've, I've been, I was 20, 25, um, and I really dived into it. And I had gone to therapy before that, but it was always other things. Um, but in this season, it was more like me really searching myself and seeing toxic things within me, addressing immaturity within me, or just issues that I had that I just like could not ignore anymore. So in those therapy sessions, I was at one time going three times a week to therapy. It was intense. And it perfectly aligned to where when I did get into my church and I did meet my pastor and we started doing a lot of spiritual counseling, I realized that therapy makes voids apparent, right? So if you have a void, a lot of people, like if you have a void or an insecurity or an issue, you try to fill it with something else. So it might be people pleasing, it might be spending money, it might be, you know, getting awards and all these things. But spiritual warfare and understanding that helps you tie the two together. So as therapy shows you the voids, spiritual warfare and spiritual wellness shows you how to properly fill them or address them and understand that just as anxiety and depression, those are um, mental struggles. If you do any reading or research in the Bible, those are spirits. Depression is a spirit, just as it's a diagnosis. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah. What do you mean it's a spirit? So it's a conversation first. I always say that on, on lies. I'm like, okay, we're going to go. We're going to deep dive. But for me, um, I was able to address the fact like, okay, I'm depressed. I, I have all the physical attributes of this, right? And it's responses to what's going on in my life. 
But everything that we see here in the physical realm is going on in the spiritual realm. So a lot of people will go through something and be like, oh, it's a coincidence. Or what a coincidence, I'm having this huge life crisis. What a coincidence, my mom had this same issue. My grandmother had this same issue. And not realizing generational curses, strongholds, right. you know. And when you get those things, and I remember talking to my pastor because I was struggling a lot. And she had told me one day, she's like, but what you're feeling right now is not even for your experience today. This is generational. Like you are detoxing, you are purging, you are dealing with things that had nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. And that's a part where I feel a lot of us aren't comfortable going because a lot of people don't want to have those conversations. They don't want to look crazy. Yeah, of course. And mm -hmm. it's a lot of work. It, it's a lot of work. A lot of work. But I mean, you get to blame your family for some of it. So <laughs> no. that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Blooming Bear, your second book. Mm -hmm. You talked about it a little bit that you started it during the first book, mm -hmm. but what kind of place were you in when you were writing it and what really influenced it? So when I first began writing it, a lot of the, because um, it's poetry and prose, right? Unlike Questions, mm -hmm. Christ, and the Quarter Life Crisis, which is more of a novel and a testimony, this is poetry and prose. So that book I dedicated to myself because I was starting to really embrace the fact that everything that you go through, positive, negative, good, bad, you know, understood, or just people looking at you like, what, what, what are you doing with your life? Yeah. <laughs> um, the true beauty in life is taking off the mask. It's removing who you expected yourself to be. It's making peace with the fact that your life plan and God's plan for your life may not be the same thing. And a lot of times the best way for us to get bare is to go through this shedding or, you know, suffering. So that's where Blooming Bear came from. It's like you're going to go through times where you are looking in the mirror and you don't even know who you're looking at. You're going to go through times where it's like you're mourning yourself. So what's a support system look like during that? Because, I mean, it's very raw, it's very vulnerable, and, in, I mean, you got to have people around yeah. you who understand that. Is that something that you can build if it's not built in? It's something that I, I truly believe is aligned. Because if I look at myself today and I look at my support system and my circle of friends and people I consider, like, my family, spiritual family, mm -hmm. it looks very different than before I – join my church or before I really started diving into that therapy because it's a source of alignment, not acceptance. It's, it's bonds, not just a bloodline. So during those times, I was in seasons of being still. Like I wrote a lot, but nobody really knew what was mm -hmm. essentially going on with me. And that is something I talk about in that book too, uh, the, the beauty of being still, the beauty of revelation and understanding that you don't have to explain yourself to people. You don't have to make things make sense to them. You don't have to clear anything up with anyone. Life, nine times out of 10, becomes a lot better when you don't correct people and you correct yourself. And you see situations in yourself and your environment as it is, not as you want it to be. So that, um, it really showed me. And I have, I tell people, I'd, I'm not in the market for friends. God aligns me with them. Mm -hmm. But I'm not looking for people we connect with each other. Right. That's mm -hmm. so interesting because mm -hmm. I don't think that's the mindset most people mm -mm. have about it. No. But that leads perfectly into the next two questions. So this one is, is it possible to feel affection for and miss a person who treated you very badly? Of course. And they said very badly. Very badly. Okay. <laughs> of course. Because when you think about even the topic of resentment or things like that, when you think of a person you resent, it's not a stranger. It's not someone that just, like, left a hateful comment on your social media. It's someone you love. Because mm -hmm. whether they did something purposely or they don't even know, you feel this because you had love or you had expectation or you expected for someone to reciprocate. It left this bad taste in your mouth or it left you struggling to forgive. And going back to the being still thing, if you are in that season – it's very easy for resentment to creep in because your spirit is growing, right? And you're maturing and those frustrations are bringing spiritual fruit and you're getting um, self-control and patience and understanding and extending mercy. But you're also, your flesh is getting very aggravated because right. you're literally looking at 
you know, well, why, why am I experiencing this or why is it this way? So it's, it's very easy to even to detach from people that you love. There are people, and my husband clowns me all the time because he's like, well, you're different than me because I will detach because I understand like I need to, but I will pray for you. And I truly want good things for people because our journey right now may have to stop. But that doesn't mean that you won't get therapy or you won't have an awakening yourself or you won't work on your spiritual well-being and then we can align later on. Everyone has to take their own path. Everyone, yeah. What do you do? Do you want to get up here and talk about... <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Okay. So this one is also really good. Letting people go. How do you do it without an apology? Compassion. And understanding motive, right? There are people that are going to hurt you knowingly and unknowingly. And if I'm being very honest, there are a lot of people in life that have hurt me unknowingly because I never address. I don't do this clapback thing. I don't do this thing. I, again, I'm very much of like a revelation person. So my thing is I just need to have that confirmation. But I can let you go with love, especially, too, if it's something malicious. Like I see it. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge it to myself. And you can go, and I, and I say the word compassion, <laughs> and I have to d dive in, because that took me years to understand. Yeah. But you'll have resentment because people will do things like purposely or just, and it'll shock you. And it will shake you because, again, expectation, I wasn't ready for this. My expectation said you were going to do something different. So you always have to remind yourself that that person is not you. That person doesn't know every thought you've had. That person doesn't know everything about you, your feelings, your conversations, your experiences. They can assume. They can sit around a table and talk, but they don't know. And you also have to understand that not everyone has had the same work that you've had. Not everyone has sat on a therapist's couch. Not everyone has gone to Bible study. Not everyone has looked in the mirror and said, I am the common denominator in my life. So if something's wrong, what can I do? Not everyone comes from that. And a lot of people, too, come from places where dysfunction still functions. So you can't expect people that don't search themselves or don't acknowledge the need to dive deeper within their own lives to do that with you. Right. So that's where the compassion comes, where it's like, I have to forgive you for, you know, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I have to forgive you, especially if you know what you're doing, because if you're purposely doing something to hurt me, that's just revealing that there's something deeply wrong within yeah. you. Yeah. So The Tears That Taught Me is your third book, and mm -hmm. it's your second poetry collection. That was released uh, last year. Mm -hmm. How is it different from your two previous books? Because kind of like um, what we were just saying, I think at that point, as time goes on, you look at old things with fresh eyes. And I really feel like that's where compassion and empathy even more came into play because now you're at a place in your life or a place in your healing where you can really articulate, no, this was foul or they were wrong or I was wrong. And you've done enough crying. You've cried about it. I mean, you can literally cry a river over some things, but what did those tears teach you? What did those hard times, even now, you know, some people went through things 20 years ago and now they're just starting to look back and see yeah, that was horrible, but those hard times made me pray more. Those hard times made me really assess myself. Those hard times made me, you know, be mindful of the music I listen to, the way I care. So you, you, the reframing takes place. What were some of the biggest shifts in your life when you started looking at that? Because I think you say the music you listen to, the people you surround yourself with. There's a lot of little things that I think people might not think about. Mm -hmm. it, isolation. Yeah. Because isolation for me started out of depression. And when you get in that type of isolation and you feel like you don't trust people or you don't trust yourself, or you don't trust life because you're trying to figure out what the heck is going on in my head or in my life or all this stuff, that type of isolation can lead to just not good thoughts. Right. Right? And... But if you look at isolation from a spiritual aspect, isolation is where you really get to see what is. 
And that's, I feel people get very addicted to it because when you start seeing you, right? Mm -hmm. Because a little bit of something means more of everything. So when you're going to start looking at you and you're going to say, man, this is toxic within me. This is immature within me. I'm a good person, but this was foul. Like this was wrong. You know, just different things. Yeah. Then you start looking at it the same way with people, with situations, with music, all kinds of stuff, because you realize like, okay, well, I'm just going to use an example. Like if I don't, if I don't tolerate um, negativity from me, then I'm not going to tolerate negativity from you. I'm not going to listen to things that I'm good, and then I turn the radio on, and I'm ready to do a drive-by, and I live in a cane field. <laughs> Something th <laughs> the math is not mathing, okay? <laughs> you have to make it make sense. So if you want positivity, if you want clarity, if you want peace, you have to start making those honest assessments of yourself and then those honest assessments of who is bringing peace to me? What type of music is bringing peace to me? What, what am I wearing? If someone sees me, are they going to look at me and say, and it's not, and I, you cannot judge a book by its cover. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is as you change your mind, how you show up changes. What you allow changes. And you, it may even turn up in, in, into you not showing up. Because you're like, I'm just this environment, these people. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, you can't have my energy. And that's, and we always say that, that's mm -hmm. the currency. A lot of people in the world look at things through a lens of ego and power. Like, oh, if I could make you not come here or I can make you not do, I have power over you. And it's like, no, I work from energy. So you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I have control over her or him. And this person is sitting there like, no, honey, you're not worth my words. You're not worth my presence. I'm not giving you access. So it shifts. So we got a ton of questions about toxic relationships. Mm -hmm. But what I thought was different was interesting was that they were all different. A lot of them were friendships, relationships, mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. Talk about just kind of what is similar between all those things. And some mm -hmm. are going to be harder to draw the line than others. Um, i just say right off top, love, loyalty, and proximity. So... Every day I'm posting, right, and I tell this to people, I always use this example. You will always have someone that has something to say, good, bad. They might love what you say. They might have the most critical thing. But after you do that work within yourself, you just realize that people can only give you what they have. So if someone can only give you, I'm going to say this, whether it's a family member or a friend, mm -hmm. if, you can, if I have a conversation with you, Shanna, mm -hmm. and I can be vulnerable, and I feel safe, and I feel comfortable, and I can tell you the deepest things, the most raw things, that shows something with you, that shows that energy-wise, right. that I'm connected to you. But again, going back to the self-assessment and toxicity, you become, very, it's not hard to identify it in other people once you have owned yourself after you've looked at yourself and you've mourned yourself. Or even, too, a lot of people, when you go through that, you, you go through a season where you are so angry with yourself because now you have wisdom. Now you have a different perspective. So now you're just a lot harder on yourself. So you're not going to allow yourself to be in certain situations and around certain types of things. So that is the perfect setup for another question, which is I think something all people struggle with, especially mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. is what advice do you have for people who are too hard on themselves and who struggle to get over things they regret? Yeah, that takes a while. <laughs> but also embracing the fact that every version of you had to show up for you to be the person you are now. If we would never make mistakes, if we would never be hurt, if we would never hurt other people, we wouldn't have the empathy, the awareness, and the maturity that we have. Think back to when we first started this conversation, and mm -hmm. I said, in 2016, all I did was write positive things. And I had wisdom to the level at which I had exposure. You knew what you knew. I knew what I knew because I was exposed to a certain amount of things. But as I was exposed to more things in life, and I, some tests I passed, some, some tests I failed. And even in that, I had to look at it and say, Morgan at 24, 25, Morgan at 31, about to be 32, we're different people, but I have to understand and have compassion for her because she didn't know what I know now. She didn't look at things. She didn't even know of a spiritual realm, okay? I didn't even know spiritual warfare was a thing. So I could only 
give compassion to that person, no matter if it was positive or negative, because I didn't, I wasn't who I am. I didn't know then what I know. And then, but it also helps me too, that if someone does fall short, or if someone even offends me, I look at myself and say, well, there was a point that you were immature. There was a point that you just looked at what looked good to the world and not what was good for you or within you. So it helps you extend mercy and have grace for other people. Always something kind, but I always say you can be cordial but not close. I will always have a good word for you. There are people that we all can say in our minds. If we think of just anything throughout our lives, there have been people that may have mistreated us knowingly or unknowingly, and then they want to be like, I miss you. Yeah. (laughs) And you're not going to be ugly, but you acknowledge the fact that I've, I've learned and I've grown and I've seen, I've seen myself, I've seen the world as it is. And there's nothing wrong with being kind and having conversation. But that looks a lot like I'm here if you want to talk to me, but you're not going to see me in your missed call log. You're not going to see me text you and say, hey, let's do lunch. I'm going to see you when I see you, and I will give you nothing but love and consideration and respect because that is that should be t- top tier for everyone. I feel everyone is out that. But as for access, as for vulnerability, as for testimonies, not everyone should have that. And that's where you apply that lesson. So one of the things that you talk about all the time is having conversations, Mm -hmm. how important it is to have conversations. And I was thinking about today Mm -hmm. that when I first met you, Mm -hmm. you were having these conversations, Uh but you were having them in a much different way. Uh You were, you didn't approach it like you do now. Mm -hmm. How do you grow to be as comfortable as you are having these conversations, no matter what, we're going to talk about it? Suffering. (laughs) <laughs> no, like literally, that's the first good suffering, news. <laughs> suffering, frustration, um, people doing things to provoke you. You learn it's as crazy as it sounds. The negative is what brings the positive. The the things that like when people even say turn the other cheek type of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the times that your flesh is tested that you get those spiritual gifts and you understand that. Listen, if I have a word for you. I truly, it's not my concern or my business. If you believe it, if you embrace it, if you think it's true, false, that's your business. But I have a responsibility to share some things. And there were times of my life that I really feel going back, I needed me. That's why I do this. I remember just going on Google, just typing things, hoping that I would find someone that felt the things I was going through or was experiencing what I was going through because I didn't trust telling people. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a world where everyone's like, oh, if you're going through something, you should have talked to someone. Well, are you are you the type of person that people can come to or who would even receive it? Right. You know, and I think that's the thing, especially in mental health. Like we we blame people for walking around and suffering in silence. We blame people for having these thoughts. But are you a person that's safe? Mm -hmm. Are you a person that when if you hear rumors or you see chaos or are you going to gossip and get scoop? Mm-hmm. Because if you have shown me that that's who you are, then you have also shown me that you that's how you handle silliness, foolishness. So I'm not going to give you the opportunity to mishandle pain, vulnerability, real problems. So it's being a thing to where I've had people, whether social media or just people on the street, like Rusty will tell you, just come up and tell me their life because they know, number one, I'm not saying anything. There is nothing worse than I feel abusing a person's confidence. You've made yourself a safe space for a lot of people, and that's really wonderful. Because people need a safe space, and they need to know that I'm not being judged. These words that I'm giving this person, they're not trying to, oh, I wonder if they mean. No, I'm giving you what I'm giving you. (laughs) So if you don't see it in the world, then maybe you don't see it because you need to become it. Maybe you are the open book that you need it. And that's how I feel you have to look at all situations in life. So what's next? Are you going to keep up the four, a book a year streak? (laughs) Yes. Yes, I I am. And we're in a new year. Yes. So um, on pace. Yes, on pace. So be on the lookout. But 
I'm definitely in a season, and I realized that, and I had a long conversation with my pastor at the end of the year where I had that confirmation of there are seasons, right? We talk about seasons of being still. Well, I'm in a season of being bold, which is why I'm comfortable having this conversation with you. Typically, I'd just be in my Snuggie, <laughs> minding my business, but this is the season to share your testimony, and you know this because God will send you people where it's like this person needs your truth. This person needs your vulnerability. And the things that I'm working on now, it is I'm talking about God. And if you don't want to hear it, you don't want to read it, then don't. Right. But I've been prepared for this season and this version of me is showing up. So. Yeah. So what do you have to close with? <sighs> that all things work together. Truly. If you give it to God, if you work on yourself, and, and you stay focused. You know, we get so sidetracked, and there's so many opportunities for distraction, people's opinions, social media, even mm -hmm. our feelings. But if you can connect to the source and the one that created you and wise counsel, you will realize that even the things that were meant to destroy you will detox you and develop you for greater. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So where can everybody follow along for all updates on all things Morgan? Yes. Well, um, Instagram, Facebook, Modern Morgan, and I just made a, a YouTube. So we're growing. We're on different platforms, but we're definitely taking these conversations and vulnerability to another level. Awesome. We can't wait to see what's next. Thank you. So Morgan will be back here. She has some <laughs> books. And thank you all. Stick around.